Okay, welcome everybody to Deer Eyes of the Left uh, 2013. I hope you guys are as much fun with it as I am. Uh, my name is Tyler. I, uh, I go to the University of Maryland Sociology Department. Um, this is our panel about politics, uh, the new politics of participation and persuasion. Uh, we've got four presenters. I'm going to let them present themselves. Um, tweet your questions at TGWC2 is the tag. C for the room, two for the session. Uh, be sure to use both. It'll make it a lot easier for us to find you. Um, yeah, with that, uh, here's... Uh, Laura Meadows and Daniel Chris. at the 2012 Democratic National Convention in Charlotte. What we sought to do is recreate um, Kurt Lang and um, Gladys uh, Engel Lang's uh, classic fieldwork of media events uh, that they conducted at the dawn of the age of television. So walking in very large uh, footsteps, we um, were able to create the first ethnography of a modern day convention. So, while we have your rapt attention for the next 15 minutes, uh, we're going to go over uh, our method. We're going to talk about some of the, our findings around uh, what a uh, contemporary media event looks like. And then we want to use some time to talk about uh, Twitter publics and uh, a concept we're developing uh, called active spectatorship, which is allowing us to, to think through the role of media events and the role of Twitter publics and the value of spectatorship to uh, democratic theory in a network world. So, um, there were three of us. It was Daniel, myself, and then another graduate student from UNC. And we were in Charlotte for five days of official and unofficial events. And the events ranged from the Occupy Wall Street <coughs> South rally and march, to official delegate caucuses, to uh, the evening's commission speeches. Um, we tended to, to focus our work on uh, locations inductively determined to be uh, hot spots for political and journalistic actors. So some of those spaces included the convention hall where the delegates and the press had workspaces. Well, we spent quite a bit of time um, at a space called The People. It was an office set up for non-credentialed uh, journalists as well as activists. Um, we spent a lot of time at the Charlotte Epicenter, which is where MSNBC, CNN, and Bloomberg staged their media production during the, the convention. Time Warner Arena is where the convention speeches were held every night. And it was also a space where the press broadcast every day. They'd set up temporary studios and they would broadcast from that space. Um, all of three of us had media credentials, which granted us access to the convention hall, to the arena. Uh, we were also able to access like a, the Google Hangout, which is right here, it's one of the more fun hip places to be in Charlotte. Um, we had access to the Fox, Fox News broadcast area, which was actually a bit sequestered and maybe not quite as hip or cool. Um, and we also had credentials for the people, so we were able to, uh, to operate in their workspace as well. Uh, each of our works research days began around 9 in the morning at the people and ended at 11.30 in the evening after the, the, the night speeches were over. So what we did each day was we, we split up strategically to try to maximize our observations. As you can imagine, there was more than a lot going on in Charlotte at that time. So uh, we divided and conquered. And what we were able to do was uh, we interviewed uh, individuals working at People to see how they were using the space, how they were using uh, media. We interviewed delegates, um, convention delegates, about their social media use. We observed the workspaces of legacy media outlets we observed broadcast of the slightly sequestered Fox News stage. Um, we spent time observ observing production stages and uh, other sites of uh, network outlets, such as MSNBC and CNN. Um, and then all during the day, we followed various Twitter streams. Um, the hashtag DNC2012 was incredibly popular, but there were many others. For instance, um, LGBT DNC was a popular hashtag. There were certain communities that formed on Twitter where we were able to follow their communication that way. And then finally, for two of the convention nights, 
uh, two of us would go in the arena, and then one of us would um, essentially get bar duty. We would go to a bar and watch the convention on network and cable television, follow Twitter streams that way, and then be able to compare our experiences inside the arena versus outside. Um, so, first of all, we'll talk about what we found out about contemporary media events. Um, Diane and Katz, uh, seminal work published in 1992, argued that media events are shared rituals that interrupt daily life, they, they're broadcast live, uh, they follow pre-planned scripts that both reveal and reify social order, and they ultimately build social solidarity. Uh, to these authors, conventions are integrative events that legitimate democratic contests. Um, they also argue that there are limits to the social control any actor can wield, because events like conventions are co-produced between broadcasters and organizers and the audience. However, over the past decade, the original media events work has been um, has undergone both critique and revision, uh, particularly in light of media change. So, uh, contemporary scholars have argued for three primary changes. First, uh, they have argued that. The shifts in media technologies have led to audience fragmentation, which has uh, ended the capacity of media events to build social solidarity. A another criticism and a request for change, um, scholars have questioned whether media events were ever actually um, about creating and reifying shared values in light of a pluralistic society. And then finally, even more critical scholars argue that media events can serve to legitimate authority uh, and to provoke quiescence. Um, and yet, we, we found something very different during our time in Charlotte. Um, first, uh, contra scholars of fragmentation, we found a, a centering of public discourse. Uh, we found the attention of the body, body politics discourse focus on the convention. So let me point to a few examples to, to back that up. Um, cable news channels devoted multiple hours each night to the convention. Uh, network channels, or the networks, um, covered the major speeches. Um, for the first two nights of the convention, 25 million viewers tuned in, and then for the third night for Barack Obama's speech, 36 million people uh, tuned into the broadcast. There were pro approximately 35,000 attendees of the convention in Charlotte. They included Daniel and I, as well as um, journalists, bloggers, activists, delegates, and interestingly, nearly everyone there was producing some type of media. So for instance, I conducted maybe I think about 40 interviews with delegates, and they range from 30 years old to 68, and nearly every one of, them would, uh, one of them was using social media in some way, whether it was Facebook or Pinterest or Twitter um, or their political blogs, to try to communicate the convention to their local communities and to try to personalize it. Um, we're <coughs> working on a kind of like a companion piece of this work. We're doing a content analysis of um, political blog coverage on the 50 most trafficked political blogs. And what we've found so far is nearly 40% of all posts generated from September 1st through September 9th focus on the DNC. So 40% just on that one event. Um, so that there is quite a bit of support for this idea that the public discourse has been centered. And then finally, um, if you look at Twitter statistics, it certainly speaks to this effect. Um, for the three days of the convention, 9.5 million tweets were sent out into the world about the DNC. And during Michelle Obama's speech, Twitter traffic peaked at 28,000 tweets per minute. And then during Barack Obama's speech, it was 52,000 tweets per minute. So there's clear evidence for a centering of the discourse. And um, in a, the Diane and Kat sense, uh, the attention was focused. There was a convening of a mass public. Um, and there's some evidence that it fosters social solidarity. So I'm going to let the heavy hitter finish it up. Um, so what I want to talk about a little bit uh, today is sort of fill up on, on what Laura uh, started, which is to say if media events like the Democratic National Convention still sort of center the attention of the public, um, the question is uh, what do people do there and what do they do around it and how can we think about it in relation to democratic practices? Um, so one of the things that we do in the paper is we spend a lot of time um, with Jeffrey Alexander's work, who's a cultural sociologist at Yale. Um, and what he has argued in, in a series of words is that um, really uh, the arguments of politicians and elected officials and democratic processes play out in something he calls the civil sphere. And within the civil sphere, there are certain anchors, um, uh, which are basically cultural values 
Um, that relates to things uh, such as equality and liberty and justice. Um, and within uh, that sort of in the civil sphere, politicians sort of buy to become collective representations, to represent the body politic. But importantly for Alexander is that they have to do so by speaking this language of equality, of liberty, and justice in some way. Um, and what Alexander is very concerned about is sort of public performances. So the ways that politicians, for example, get up in front of a stage and articulate um, civic values and try to fuse what it is that they stand for with their particular audiences um, to then become vessels for civic hopes and desires, as we've sort of seen with, with, with the two Obama campaigns. Um, now, what's important is that elected officials do not control their own means of publicity. Um, which Alexander and other uh, political theorists, such as Jeffrey Edward Green, argues would sort of slide into fascism. Um, so what's important here is that um, conventions and general nominating contests and elections more generally are sort of ritualized forms of combat um, where actors become sort of the subject of critiques of their rivals, uh, both within parties and outside of parties. Um, and one of the important roles that we spend a lot of time talking about in the paper are the roles of journalists and how they evaluate performances like at the Democratic National Convention. So you can see in this lovely slap, uh, snapshot is that um, basically you know, journalists take this position from the skyboxes looking down and stand in judgment of these political performances. Um, and they talk about them with, on civic terms, right? Again, how well does this particular actor uh, evoke and uh, seem to fit with democratic values in the civil sphere. So not parochial values, not family values, not religious values, civic values, the language of democracy uh, in Alexander's argument. Um, now what was very interesting to, uh, interesting to us was that all of a sudden there's all sorts of new intermediaries who are also spectating at events like this. So this is just sort of looking down at the blogger section. Obviously citizen journalism, uh, network journalism has sort of given rise to new actors who play this spectatorship role. So one of the things that we were thinking a lot about was how do we conceptualize this role of the public critique of performances on social media such as Twitter uh, and Twitter publics. Um, so this is a bit washed out unfortunately but it's a, a wonderful shot of how many people sitting in the audiences were sort of simultaneously using their cell phones. Um, and as Laura just sort of mentioned, right, 9.2 million tweets over the course of the convention. Uh, we have no way of knowing how many actually came from within that arena itself, uh, but there were constantly sort of calls to be using that hashtag uh, DNC2012. Um, but the idea is that essentially media events like this now convene networked publics around it. Um, so the question is, what do people do when they're spectating around these media events? And what we really want to argue is that publics have become newly active. Um, active in being able to engage uh, in spectatorship practices where they voice their critique, where they voice their endorsement, where they might voice uh, dissensus, where they might look to reinterpret civic values. Um, but at the same time, they're still in that spectator role. They're not participants in uh, the media events in particular ways. Now what's important I think for us is that this public is active in speaking within this realm of civic values that the media event falls within in a convention. Um, however, if anyone was sort of following a Twitter feed during the convention itself, and this is really great, we were sitting there taking field notes, watching on TV, and then watching just that hashtag DNC 2012, it's a rollicking debate. Uh, to put it mildly, right? So there's lots of Republicans and Tea Party groups who are on there. They're critiquing one another. They're critiquing the Democratic Party's performances. Of course, there's also Democratic partisans who are backing President Obama and who are retweeting those messages out. Um, you know, there's social movements like Occupy Wall Street who are on there and making their own and advancing their own critiques, etc. So that if you're sort of watching this hashtag roll by, it's really this newly active forum um, where many different publics are gathering together, where they're engaging in active forms of democratic spectatorship, they're not necessarily participating, but we think what has value is that in the spectatorship, in taking away the means of publicity simply from the powerful themselves, that we can sort of value that role on democratic grounds as enabling um, active forms of spectatorship, active forms of citizenship uh, in a way that sort of is an organized way of critiquing the official political performances and ultimately checking their power. Um, so what we really wanted to do is sort of how do we sort of think realistically about the roles and the, and the capacities the public has to act in this new media world 
without necessarily saying that we're completely uprooting uh, established democratic or electoral processes. Um, so we sort of take that, that middle ground uh, of sorts. So with that, uh, we'll stop um, and hand it over to the next speaker. California governor's election, for obvious reasons, because movie star right goes on to be governor. However, there was another election that night, uh, a much smaller one, uh, which in the long analysis, I think might be prove uh, a more important focal point going forward in terms of our analysis of electoral politics. It was the election of this man, Don Regal, to Congress. He was a former IBM executive who was elected for the first time to Michigan's 7th congressional district. What's important about the, the Regal story is how he won the first election in 1966. At first, Regal was trailing by something over 30, like 30 points, yet he managed to close that gap and eventually win by a margin of eight points. And he did so not through broadcast media, although he was uh, charismatic in broadcast media, but rather his strategic advantage was his advanced use of data-driven politics. Indeed, Regal's campaign is perhaps the first example of a rigorously data-driven political campaign. Regal's campaign deployed data analysis to identify which voters in which precincts were the most persuadable. He was one of those ones who was effective at sort of getting the Reagan Democrats far before Reagan was getting the Reagan Democrats nationally, um, getting the sort of blue-collar uh, union Democrats to switch over, and thus allowed him to sort of focus on those areas because he was able to identify those voters in later. So, in Sasha Eisenberg's uh, recent book, Victory Lab, he chronicles the effort of data-driven politics. He actually covers uh, the Regal case and its rise to prominence in the American electoral landscape. Captured this is one of the key moments. Indeed, while mass media is indeed a powerful force in elections, the other half of the story here in the late 20th century is the ability to use data to manipulate and social engineer elections to gain a competitive advantage. And perhaps it's now a central feature, I'll argue, at least in some respects, a 21st century uh, victory campaign. To be sure, targeted political persuasion in the service of generating votes has a long history, one that certainly predates computational data, as Eisenberg aptly chronicles in the book, and as Dana can chronicle too from some of his research. Um, you know, for example, this man got his start as a direct male expert, his ability to sort of carve up the electorate and, and understand uh, demographics, to discern how to appeal to different segments, is what made him powerful. Believe me, it wasn't his sort of ability to perform math on, on Fox television. Um, <laughs> so why now? Why do I think this particular concern is important? Why is it sort of harshing my digital politics civic mellow? Um, I, I'm generally positive about, about the internet as a public sphere, or sorry, the internet as a public space, perhaps not public sphere, but uh, sort of the internet public and civics. Because with the increasing prevalence of the digital network as a communicative media, the ability to track, store, and share information has exponentially increased, altering the relations between these electoral institutions, political parties, and the public, right? Altered power relations. So underlying, my underlying theoretical claim is that technology changes our relation to democracy, not in a simple deterministic way, 
but rather the technological medium which forms the substructure of our political communications and organizations certainly informs and shapes our democratic practices. A particular medium both constrains and enables social formations, communications, and power relations. Thus, with the change in the means of communication comes a change in the way that we practice democracy. And this is McLuhan's, the medium is the social message. In Philip Howard's book, uh, New Media Campaigns and the Managed Citizens, he documents what he calls the rise in hypermedia campaign, one which adopts digital technologies for campaign purposes, and one which transforms its organizational practices to reflect these sort of new campaign mediums. Published in 2006, so is prior to the Obama campaign, the book covered the first Obama campaign, how the prior 10 years were influenced by the adoptions of digital tools, so starting in 96. And then read in conjunction with Dan's book um, on the you know, Obama campaign, one begins to gain a picture of how startling uh, the 2000 political campaign began aggressively connect connecting data, starting in 2000. Political campaigns began aggressively connecting data, and then the Dean campaign even more so, um, and then harvesting it eventually for a political win. From the beginning, those working on the digital side of the campaign realized that the tools harbor both the potential to engage a wider range of citizens and gain a competitive advantage in elections. Importantly, those with the uh, campaigns begin making sort of normative assumptions and ultimately choices about the data, if you will. Unfortunately, the dial is tipped in favor of collecting and leveraging as much data as possible. It's now hard to see how uh, data, it's not hard from this to see how a, a data arms race ends up taking place. There's a clear parallel here in the attempt by corporations to collect, store, and analyze data in an effort to persuade consumers to purchase goods and capture market share. The most telling story of this was featured uh, recently in the New York Times uh, about collecting big data with the Target case and how they built a pregnancy index, a scale of sort of one to 100 to detect if somebody was pregnant. The ultimate goal here is behavioral targeting. The holy or rather unholy, depending on your perspective, grail of marketing. Uh, targeting sort of consumers below the level of conscious awareness. Uh, now, we could argue whether or not this is fair play in terms of economic relations, whether it upsets the balance between consumers and corporations. And it does. Um, but, but for now, let's just table that discussion um, and consider how this type of large-scale data collection, aggregation, analysis can be used for political ends and how this represents a significant shift in the political relations between citizens. And one of the concerns here is that we simply do not know enough about what has occurred within these campaigns. But let's take, for example, just one corporation campaign grid. Uh, they have an 80% success rate at matching voter records to online databases. I show this probably actually increase since they gave this quote. Um, with a goal of doing that 100%. So what is particularly powerful here, or nefarious, is the meaning, is the merging of public data about politics with private commercial data, uh, both on online trackers and sort of credit cards. Imagine all the info Google has, credit card info companies have, is merged with sort of the, the public records. And so they look building like 15,000 points of data on each, on each person. The Catalyst database used by the DNC matches 450 points of data. And in 2008, the DNC stored something like 10 times the amount of data that it stored in 2004. And in 2012, they had five times the staff for dealing with data. So they're kind of giving a sense of their data growth. Well, prior to the election, uh, the November election, many of the journalism accounts of the hybrid campaigns or the hybrid media campaigns focused on how Republicans were closing that technology gap, sort of leveraging Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter to directly connect with voters. The more you dig in, the more you realize this elect last election wasn't even close. Right? The real juice in the hypermedia and hybrid campaigns were the tactics below the level of messaging and engagement. Right? If you just focus on messaging and engagement, you miss the difference here. And on this level, the two campaigns weren't even close. It's like one's fighting with a sausage and one's got a lightsaber. <laughs> so following the election, as the range of stories that had been embargoed until the end of the campaign were published, it became increasingly clear clear that the Obama campaign was, technically speaking, running a different campaign. Reports on Swampland, ProPublica, Ars Technica, The Atlantic Monthly, all document this story. So every evening, 
the Obama campaign would run something like 66,000 simulations about the election. This is their data room to model the current state of the race. And the campaign's chief data scientist was someone who used to work for supermarkets, sort of analyzing the key fob data and credit card purchases with an idea towards maximizing sales, right? Same literacy, maximize sales, maximize votes. The campaign got to the point where they could send out an email and know how much money they were going to get back. They leveraged data to understand everything from people's TV viewing habits to the most efficient ad buys, or for example, how the campaign realized that one of the demographic groups that was not giving at the rate that they could quote afford was young women aged 30 to 40, hence the dinner with Sarah Jessica Parker. Right? They had lots of campaign uh, volunteers to choose from, but this one targeted the demographic group they were trying to get the most money from. So her selection was a deliberate effort to target that group. They could do A-B testing in non-swing states to figure out what was effective, and then use what was effective in the battleground states. And perhaps most concerning here was this use in conjunction with the behavioral targeting group, a group the New York Times labeled the academic dream team, who carefully crafted messages designed to manipulate voters below the level of perception to ensure that they would vote. So they had these messages that were ideally crafted, sort of like socially scientifically crafted. So Mr. Jones, we know you have voted in the past, right? And they know this is effective at getting people to feel guilty and feel like, oh, I've already bought in four years ago. It's my obligation to come out and vote, right? It's the same thing as those voting stickers. It's social norming, but it's social norming in sort of a far more subtle way. Now, this is likely to get worse. Imagine the ability of campaigns to monitor Facebook postings to find voters who are terminally ill or have a relative who is and thus likely susceptible to healthcare pitches or the ability to monitor credit reports and ascertain more discreetly individuals' financial situations for raising money, or crafting individual messages even at the level of image, color, and word choice to subtly persuade voters, or the ability to even build a happiness or a depression index on individual swing voters and exploit mental state to yield votes. The scenarios might seem like science fiction, but when one studies the range of possibilities here and what corporations are already doing, the future of these tactics is deeply concerning. So there are two broad reasons that I think this should concern us. First is my practical set of, of concerns. As Howard highlights in his book on hypermedia campaigns, the degree to which citizen attributes or data is now bought and sold on the marketplace has rather significant consequences. There is little transparency about how this data is used and the legislation which governs the collection and trafficking in this kind of political data is scanned. Right? We don't know what's going on. As the recent story about the DNC considering selling its data to credit card companies, and eventually they back down on this, indicates we just don't know. And while in the early days of hypermedia campaigns, the suggestion was that the digital campaigning would lower the cost for running for office, this type of data-driven social engineering campaign does precisely the opposite, right? For this type of modeling data collection and management is very expensive. So this creates new powerful players on the political landscape, credit card companies, internet companies, which traffic in web data gain significant advantage. What would happen if, say, Mark Zuckerberg decided to give his data to Chris Christie, but not to the challenger? What kind of competitive advantage is that? And finally, what does this do to the electorate? Right? Rather than addressing a large-scale political culture, as perhaps the campaigns are meant to do, right, a mass political culture, individual voters are targeted and actually fractures the voting public, creating ones which are particularized and focused. This is the rise of issue publics who are independently manipulated to achieve campaign victory. The electorate will start perceiving vastly different campaigns. The publics will see uh, each campaign sort of tailored to his or her individual voting habits. Now, in the Victory Lab, Eisenberg sees this trend to social scientific election practices as a positive term. He wants to argue that the ability to engage a wider variety of voters increases voter involvement voter involvement and voter turnout, which it does. Um, but there's a downside here as well. And again, as Howard and others have noticed, this can lead to serious political redlining. If we recognize that the current electoral co college system has negative consequences, leading presidential campaigns to focus on battleground states to the exclusion of most of the electorate, imagine the ability to target battleground voters disenfranchising an even greater version of the electorate. What if we had just battleground voters instead of battleground states? Which brings me to my second large concern here, the more theoretical one. So the vision of, of democracy and, and, and citizen engagement, which is damaged by this model. In 1925, Walter Lippmann wrote, 
quite extensively on public, or what you call the phantom public, in which he claimed the public sphere no longer existed. Now, while generally speaking, I tend to side with, with Dewey and later Carey on the, on the Dewey Lippmann debates, I think in this particular respect, it behooves us to consider how carefully this almost exclusive focus on the voting function as indicative of citizen engagement damages democracy. In a democracy, I would argue that citizens perform multiple functions and multiple roles, only one of which is voting, and perhaps the most meaningless. But it's this type of intellectual engineering focuses almost exclusively on this sort of just idea of voting as citizen engagement. Indeed, to the exclusion of all other functions. First, in a democracy, citizens not only vote, but as Rosenthal and, and others have indicated, perform at least two other sets of functions. In addition to voting, citizens have a discursive role. That is, the sense that citizens sort of meet together to discuss ideas and learn from each other, form opinions, reach consensus. And the second is what Rosenthal in terms counter-democracy, a series of roles that are meant to check the accumulation of power. Imagine things like monitoring the state and rejecting policy decisions. As politics increasingly comes about winning elections, the public's role is reduced to a singular function, voting. Indeed, the point of this hyper-targeting is to remove the discursive function from the political space. No need to address the general electorate or to listen to the public. One simply finds the supporters one needs rather than listening to the supporters. I think we all like to pretend that voters are rational. That when someone goes into the voting booth and pulls the lever, they rationally control that decision. But I think we pretty much know at this point that people aren't entirely rational. In the same way that Nike can convince you that their product is hip, or that Apple products are shiny, or that McDonald's is the place you want to eat, politicians and groups with substantial financial backing can persuade voters ever more at a rational, sort of pre-discursive level. True, this has always been going on. The issue, though, is that the tools for this type of voter manipulation have now drastically increased. Big data social scientists are rapidly moving to making a world of engineering. Right? That social science is now a sub-discipline of engineering to treat humans as just things to be engineered. And before you quickly dismiss this premise, realize that companies and campaigns are already spending billions on exactly this principle of engineering the public. What happens when politics becomes merely a science of engineering? We are moving there, and what is worse, we are moving there with little or no regulation and with little or no discussion about what this means. Winning a campaign is not the same as fostering a democracy. Indeed, these are often heterogeneous goals. Technology can enable and empower both, and ultimately, as a public, I think we ought to recognize this and have discussions about the role of technology in democratic elections and public formations. All right, thank you. Lessig inspired analysis um, in that I talk about 
these four modalities uh, which regulate behavior. Um, in particular, in this case, I'm focusing on architecture and social norms. Um, uh, in terms of my methodology, I guess this is kind of a super casual ethnographic method um, in that mostly it consists of me spending a lot of time on Facebook. Um, but I, I did, so I, and I make no claims to, it's very biased, it's my Facebook mostly. I did, you know, uh, access a few other accounts, but, you know, I'd be interested to hear if anyone has anything else, any other uh, different experiences. Um, so my main questions um, involve, you know, we have this trope about, you know, uh, the revolution will be tweeted, um, the importance of uh, social media and mobilizing uh, political groups. Um, but I kind of wanted to examine like a, a counter example, um, and particularly in the case of highly controlled uh, mainstream political spectacle, i.e. the presidential elections. Um, you know, as we were just talking about, um, this is a scenario where you have billions of dollars being put toward, you know, socially engineering uh, a specific political uh, event. And this is, this is a very different thing than Tahrir Square. Um, so I want to see what is the function of social media in this kind of setting. Um, so in particular, I focus on the Facebook news feed. There's a lot of different ways to use Facebook, a lot of like sub-communities um, as with anywhere else on the internet. Um, you know, it's very uh, different thing to be cruising your news feed as opposed to being on Mitt Romney's fan page or something. Um, but I wanted to look at the news feed because I think it acts as kind of the central hub of Facebook. Um, you know, if we're talking experientially, the Facebook news feed has a kind of parallel, I think, to, um, you know, the way you would wake up in the morning and read the newspaper, and now you wake up in the morning and maybe read your news feed. Um, <coughs> So the first category I want to talk about is the modality of social norms surrounding practices on the Facebook newsfeed, the Facebook. Um, so obviously, unlike Twitter, Facebook is largely a network of personal relationships. Content posted here is highly personal and intimately connected with your everyday life. Um, uh, for an example of this maybe is that you know the Facebook status bar typically has this covering text. How are you feeling? You know, that's kind of the paradigm for what you're posting on the Facebook news feed. Um, I just have some stats here about, you know, the patterns of content posted. Um, you know, politics is just 9% versus, you know, uh, sports, art, and entertainment making up 40% of all posts. Um, so this is a kind of, you know, social norm of the kind of content you're going to be posting. Um, there's also kind of an understanding of Facebook is a, is a an asylum or an escape. Um, a metaphor I use here is kind of the idea of the, the water cooler. Um, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a general mixed company of acquaintances. You're taking a break from your daily grind. You're going to relax, gossip, share news. This is kind of the uh, social paradigm that uh, Facebook acts within. Um, keeping with this, um, <coughs> There's kind of a social taboo against posting about politics um, on the news feed, which may, you can see as a parallel between, uh, you know, in a public face-to-face -face setting, you don't, you also don't want to talk about sex, religion, or politics to avoid conflict. Um, you know, and especially at, it seems the water coolers, you know, one of, you know, in a private, at a bar maybe with your friends, it might be even more acceptable, but at the water cooler, you don't want to rock the boat. Um, <coughs> In particular, um, it became taboo to post about the elections. You know, it's a different kind of thing to post about, you know, news on global warming or, you know, Bloomberg's latest blunder, blunder um, as, as opposed to, you know, posting something about um, the elections. Um, I also want to suggest that this the taboo about posting about the elections can be attributable to inundation in the tr uh, traditional media. If you're thinking of Facebook is a kind of escape. You don't want to be confronted with the same kind of things you're being confronted with anytime you turn on the radio or anytime you look at a billboard. Um, and also sort of the horse race framing of the elections that kind of turns it into um, almost a paradigm of like sports team rivalries, like I'm on this team and you're on that team. It's very hard to kind of occupy a middle space. Um, 
you know, it's, it's posting a scene as, you know, a parallel to Go Yankees. It's kind of like that doesn't invite any kind of discussion, mostly just conflict. Um, <coughs> I wanted to show these two examples with you, which I thought were pretty funny, um, of, you know, memes that um, I found on my news feed. Um, I think that what's funny about these is that both of them reference like all of my friends and everyone is doing this, but um, the experience seems to be more that what everyone is doing is posting these kind of memes about uh, why is everyone talking about this? Can't we just get over it already? Um, so it's kind of it's funny. It seems like there's almost like a distorted distorted perception of what is even being discussed and how people are talking. Um, probably, like I said, influenced by the inundation in the media already. And so when you see just one post on your newsfeed, you're like, ah, what is this doing here? Um, here's a few more examples. Um, you know, here's one, a good example of some cynicism surrounding the elections. You know, why, you know, what's the point of even talking about this? Um, I guess I kind of want to play this video in case anyone has not seen it. Um, okay. It's 20 seconds long, so I think it's very. Um, oh, that was sound. Damn. Just, there is a there should be voice, but I plugged it in. Okay, whatever, guys. It's all right. We'll move on. Um, uh, just this video of this girl crying because she was tired of hearing about Obama and Mitt Romney, uh, which was a meme that was going around. Um, uh, and also this, I won't go to the page, but this light hacker post, you know, here's an app to block annoying political posts on Facebook, um, which I think speaks to how many people were just desperate to not be encountering any of this kind of content. Um, so those are some of like the social norms surrounding practices. Um, I also want to talk about architecture, you know, um, it's the idea of, you know, it's been brought up, uh, controlling behavior through the code or site architecture of Facebook. Um, <clears throat> so even though I made this parallel to the water cooler, um, there's the architecture of Facebook, I want to argue, actually allows for a sort of disruption of the social norms um, surrounding water cooler politics. Um, <clears throat> although they have similar sort of social rules and principles, the architecture of the newsfeed has a few advantages, uh, which allows tra uh, transcending of social taboos. Um, some great diagrams I made for you guys. Um, so when you're posting on Facebook, you're largely blind to your audience as kind of an imagined audience. You aren't thinking of any of the specific people in the audience, like your mom or your ex-girlfriend or your coworkers. Um, this makes you more likely to say things you wouldn't say in, in a face-to-face -face setting, for example, at the water cooler. Um, it's less confrontational for you, um, and also, as, it's less confrontational for the listener um, because they don't have to even acknowledge that they're listening to you. It's kind of a voyeuristic setup, and they don't have to even, in between readers, no one has to know that you actually you know, clicked on that link and read something. So when, it kind of depoliticizes both acts of speaking and acts of listening. Um, um, I also want to suggest that there's an interesting feature of the uh, architecture of the newsfeed that the water cooler doesn't share. Um, in a, when you're posting uh, political content on Facebook, you're not just, you have the ability to make your own statements, but more common, you have the ability to post content and uh, refer to um, media authorities. You can post a link to the New York Times. Um, it's kind of a hyperlinking of authority. Um, whereas you can maybe reference an article in the New York Times in a face to face conversation, you don't have the sort of direct link um, to authority you have um, when you're posting on Facebook. Um, this is also is kind of a mutual reinforcement scenario where um, by putting this sort of New York Times article in a context of, you know, your ex girlfriend posted this link, uh, let me check out what it says, it makes you more, the reader, more likely to. Um, be interested in uh, this kind of content. Um, I, I sort of want to suggest that this maybe has the potential to offer a more kind of grounded political discourse uh, by mutually reinforcing these two kinds of social authority and media authority. Um, I don't want to go into this too much, but um, I think this is a really interesting case um, where of, of sort of the blending of social norms and architecture. 
Um, there's a there was a massive study conducted uh, back in 2010 where they had um, most most people on Facebook got this sort of banner in the upper right corner, um, but then they had a few they did a few test cases where they gave people this banner or no banner at all and compared um, among other things the influence this had over whether people went and voted um, and checked against voting records um, and the their results said that people who got this message were 0.39 percent more likely to vote, and then the people who didn't get any banner or got the purely informational banner were the same. And there was no effect really on voting. Um, so I think this is really interesting. I mean, even though it's a small um, percentage change, um, the authors point out that uh, this actually gen may have generated an additional an additional 200. 82,000 validated votes, which is a lot. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think this tells us about the way the power of the social trumps the power of the informational. You know, the real, the real influence here is just these few um, indications of you know I know this person went and voted. That really does influence people a lot. Um, I think this also tells us that Facebook is getting really good at combining what they know about social norms. Um, and building that into architecture to effectively control and regulate human behavior. Um, yeah, I don't want to talk about this. Um, so, you know, even though I've kind of been, I think, trying to highlight some of the promising things about um, the face Facebook's news feed in terms of um, creating new forms of interpersonal discourse um, surrounding the elections. Um, there's still a few points such as, you know, hyperlinking authority is great. Um, it, it makes people more likely to listen to you, more likely to read the news. Um, but it still is very much dependent on, um, you know, taking the existing discourse and maybe even, we might even say that this contributes to media control of the political discourse if what I'm saying literally becomes replaced by what the New York Times is saying. Um, <coughs> I also think that there's a way that the structure of Facebook mimics the political landscape in that when you're reading an article, if you agree with it, um, you can the most you can really do is sort of like it, um, is the you know accepted way to uh, say that I agree with something. Whereas if you disagree with something, the common practice is to start a big long argument in the comments that you and your newsfeed just have to like roll your eyes and scroll past because it just becomes this total back and forth and it. It sort of creates a uh, structure where disagreement becomes very visible to an annoying degree almost, whereas agreement is silent, um, which I think actually is a really good mimic of uh, what goes on surrounding tensions in the media. Um, <coughs> just to summarize, um, uh, despite some potential of Facebook's architecture to disrupt social taboos and reinforce political content um, through this hyperlinking of authority, um, it sort of seems that the, the paradigm may, uh, of practicing political news production and consumption is largely exemplified by cynicism and disengagement. Um, I think that the sort of lesson to be learned here is um, even though you know we can look at these architectural features of Facebook and the social norms surrounding it that may encourage a new kind of you know dialogue. The technology in and of itself is not deterministic. Um, you know, it, it must be sort of embedded in a certain culture um, and of practice and a certain kind of political and media landscape. Um, and I think this leaves us with the question, what can social media do to help cultivate a culture of political engagement and alternative dialogue sort of outside of mainstream discourse, um, in, especially in the highly conservative system of the US political landscape? But if directed at the right group of battleground voters, that could be a big difference. Uh, okay, last one. Great.
It's a uh, of fine, but U.S. democracy, great, and online news. Hi, so I'm a PhD candidate in political science, and I'm recommending that you should read the my work is highly quantitative. I use experimental data and longitudinal data. And usually when I present at political science conferences, that's sort of all I put up on slides and I just talk about coefficients. And I figured that um, coming here yesterday, I realized that this might not be the right audience for that. <laughs> and so now it's equally bad, though, because now I have like a lot of words on my slides. So this is still not going to be a whole lot of fun in terms of looking at the, at the PowerPoint. Um, but I hope that I can um, still make it maybe a little more fun than just looking at a whole bunch of data by focusing more on the theoretical um, aspects of my work and sort of the motivations of why I am doing what I am doing. So in general, in my research, I think about um, what Americans uh, do with the web, how do they use the web to become politically informed, and then what does web use for political information, what does that do to people's attitudes um, and their general levels of political knowledge. I focus on historically marginalized groups because um, historically disadvantaged groups still have the least influence um, on politics in America. It comes to no surprise, I'm sure, to this crowd. Um, and I focus on the web and marginalized groups because there is a really strong connection between the media environment and political knowledge and also political equality. Quick roadmap, so I have 11 slides. Um, the first part is uh, I'll talk about the media environment and political knowledge and connection, and then I'll focus on political knowledge and political equality, what those two have to do with each other. Then I'll review sort of what political scientists have been finding, um, so my own discipline. And then I'll talk about my own research and see how that, show how that fits into um, what political scientists are doing in general. And then if I have time, I'll offer some. So let's first like all take like a big step back in time. So let's all imagine we're in 1996. People were using things like Netscape Navigator. You could make like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know, waiting for a web page to load. Mm -hmm. um, you had on, you know, you would like dial in. People didn't have broadband where they were constantly online. You would like, you know, dial in using your modem. You would maybe even compose emails offline to then send them, you know once a day or something like that. So what I'm trying to um, paint here is an image of the media environment in 1996 as very much an offline uh, media environment. We got our news from print newspapers, from the television, whether that was cable or broadcast, and then the radio. And really, people had a lot less choice. Um, compared to today where you can go online and you have this explosion of niche news sources and you can browse fairly quickly from one site to another. Um, way back then, it was a very passive kind of engagement with news. And you sort of had to take what people offered to you. So I'm talking about 1996 because 1996 is also the year that this book came out, What Americans Know About Politics and Life Matters. It was written by Deli Carpini and Keeter. And it was one of the biggest books in American politics that talks about political knowledge and what Americans know. And one of their big findings was, and why this book is very important to my work, is they found that women, minorities, and young, and poor have significantly lower levels of political knowledge than white affluent And I can define what political knowledge is a little more closely in the Q&A, but really what it is um, in their book is knowing about the processes, knowing how to influence politics, but also having certain political facts of being able to identify who Margaret Thatcher is or was, um, things like that. And it matters who knows stuff about politics and who doesn't know stuff about politics because people who know something about politics um, also have more power to influence what goes on in politics, meaning the allocation of resources, how policies are shaped, and who benefits from these policies. And if you think about the people who know something about politics, so if women, the poor, minorities, and young people don't know anything about politics, or not as much, then what is left over are white, affluent, older men. And if they're the ones who are already in a more privileged position and also able to influence government more, it becomes this perpetuating thing where privilege kind of perpetuates. 
And what's also really irksome about this whole thing is that the groups that are systematically excluded from knowledge or that don't display the same kind of knowledge that this privileged group displays, those are all um, groups that have been historically also marginalized. And so now we can fast forward to the media world that we have now. We have the internet, we have a lot of different sites, um, partisan sites, but we also have a lot of sites that really target um, marginalized groups, um, starting with minorities, but then also gays and lesbians. We've got feminist sites. Um, we've got sites for pretty much any kind of issue public. And so my question is, whether the information available on the web um, can be used by women, minorities, the young, and poor to close the knowledge gap that I described <coughs> earlier, and whether we can expect more equal political representation or more equal political influence. So I'll place this in context of what my own discipline, political scientists, and more specifically American politics scholars, what they have been um, doing, the kind of research that they have been doing, and what they've been finding, how people the big thing is that um, political scientists realize that, you know, so there, there is this new high choice media environment and it has all of these partisan niche news sites and it also offers an abundance of entertainment news. And out of this come two, um, I'm totally simplifying everything, but out of this come two big hypotheses. The first one is um, that people who are interested in politics and already hold pretty strong opinions will consume political news and become information rich, so they'll know more. While people who are not interested in politics will avoid the news and become information poor. The idea is that you have so much choice that you can totally avoid politics if you don't want to learn about them. You can just watch you know, the Kardashians or whatever. Um, and this was not possible in the old broadcast days where you really didn't have very much choice. The news were on at 5 o'clock and no matter, you know, you didn't even have a remote control, but even if you had had a remote control, switching around wouldn't have helped you because the news was on on another channel too. So there's this idea that in the broadcast days, everybody knew something about something. But now there's really this vision of, you know, some people are going to know a whole lot about politics and others are just going to kind of drop out. And the people who are going to drop out are all of those moderates. And the only people who are left are people who are very knowledgeable, but also maybe more extreme in their opinions. And they're going to turn out to vote and so we see this polarization. So I already revealed part of the second hypothesis, which is this idea that those who engage with information will engage with it selectively and seek out information that maybe even confirms existing beliefs. So this idea that we just, you know, we like to avoid cognitive dissonance. We don't want to really engage with information that challenges our standpoint. What we really want to do is just read the stuff over again that we already agree with because we like to have our existing beliefs. And the idea is that, you know, again, it's this polarization that is happening where, you know, left people will become more left and conservatives will become more conservative. So there's this cumulative effect um, of these two hypotheses on um, participation, which uh, I already outlined, kind of. So there will be people, um, so this high choice media environment uh, causes people to be very selective. And so we've got people who seek out a lot of news, the information rich people, we've got people who avoid the news completely, information poor people, and then we've got um, people who only read the news um, to confirm or harden existing ideological political beliefs. And um, the underlying idea here is, is that it all depends on the motivation. You know, what are some people are just not motivated to learn about politics, so they won't. Some people are really motivated to learn about politics in general, so they'll read everything they can and then there are people who just want to kind of like, you know, um, confirm what they already know. And so the underlying thing here is, is motivation. And so my big argument, how I fit into this discussion is that um, I argue that there are other parts of our identity that also prompt us to engage selectively with news. So we have other things that really motivate us to read news than just part of the identity. Um, so we want to know about policies that affect us and our group. Um, we want to learn about current affairs from a perspective that is not a mainstream perspective. And I predict that this might lead to better um, knowledge among minorities and other marginalized groups because that information is finally available in a really easy way, very easy to access, very easy to find. Um, there's a lot of arguments that would support um, me 
because alternative sites, um, they fulfill a really important function when compared to what we have had. So mainstream media have historically ignored marginalized populations. There's a lot of research supporting that. Uh, there's also research that shows that minorities, women, and the young tend to trust mainstream media a lot less than their affluent white male older counterparts. Moreover, media, mainstream media, decreased feelings of group identity, which we all know here, is really important um, because it relates to group consciousness, which relates to kind of political action and system blame and that kind of stuff. And then um, there's another study by David Zingandi that points out that blacks utilize the radio far more than TV to get relevant information. I'm sort of making this argument that, okay, so the web is, is the new radio for everybody. And one, of, one good example is that the Trayvon Martin case, for example, um, there was an eight-day delay um, in, for the New York Times to actually pick up on that case. The Root um, or the Grio, I don't know which one of those two online sites, the one is MSNBCs, the other one is one from the Washington Post. It's a, it's a site, or there are two sites that target African-American readers. One of them, I think it was the Grio, picked up on the Trayvon Martin case eight days before the New York Times. So it is really important. Um, now I hear everybody saying sort of like, what about the digital divide? Aren't the only people online white people? That is still to some degree true, um, but as we get access to the web in more diverse ways by, via uh, tablets and smartphones and so on, there is some compensation for the fact that a lot of minority households still don't have broadband access. Um, but you can see that 42% of African Americans, 35% of Latinos, um, compared to 43% of whites access the news online. So the gaps aren't that huge there, and that also points to the importance of the web for those populations. The clicker has stopped The clicker's like, shut up. <laughs> Stop talking. Um, all right. So I have three studies that I want to talk about. Um, so this is all from my dissertation, which uh, I'm finishing right now. And the first piece of my dissertation was that I looked at panel data. So I looked at what happened during the 2008 election. And that was originally the paper that I was going to present here, but then I was like, that's just going to be really boring. And what I looked at there was um, what happens um, to the number of opinions that um, people hold over time that were in this, in this survey. I also looked at the quality of opinions over time. So do they change over time? Quality not in a normative sense, but rather just in the sense that they become more extreme over time for people who use the web. And then does being white, black, or Latino interact in a significant way with political web use? Because I just wanted to see if there were even group differences, if there's any, uh, any uh, support for, for my idea. And so I found that after controlling on standard um, predictors that, and also on general web and television use as well as political uh, TV use, um, and also I included a lag variable for those of you who do, do longitudinal analysis, I controlled for already existing um, opinions that, that people held and existing levels of extremity um, in my model to see if really, um, if, if, if uh, there really was a change that was attributable to um, political web use over time. And I found that race and ethnicity interacted with political web use and is significant um, and positive. So this means that non-white respondents, African Americans, and Latinos um, all acquire um, a statistically significant amount of opinions um, compared to the reference group, which were Caucasians. Um, as a result of political web use. So this just, all this means is that minorities do learn a lot from the web. They use the web and they know more afterwards. I also found that um, in general, that the more respondents use the web for political information, the more extreme they became in their opinions. So if they had a moderate uh, opinion on immigration, for example, and I can talk more about how I operationalized all of this stuff, but if they had, for example, a moderate opinion on immigration, then after a couple of months, they tended to take a harder um, position on immigration, for example, or a more lenient one. They were moving in different directions. Okay, now I really have to, because uh, I want to talk about the other things, and I'm running out of time. Okay, so, anyway, so I find some support for my hypotheses. Um, both about how race matters, and I find some support for um, that the internet does cause sort of hardened um, opinions or better informed opinions. I also have um, 
uh, an experiment data from an experiment that I ran, um, which was funded by the National Science Foundation, where I had two information environments, sort of an old information environment and a new information environment, and I ran for an subject and just looked at whether Latinos and African Americans actually select minority news, and if they learn more from them than in the other control group where those were just not labeled as minority news, and that um, seems to be panning out. I'm still finishing the analysis on this. And then my last paper, and I'll shut up in a second. My last paper is um, something I'm co-authoring with, with my advisor, Richard Law. And here we're looking at whether there is this generational shift where young people have actually um, offloaded memorizing political facts to the web and whether web use can substitute for um, political knowledge stored in long-term memory. And we're finding some really good evidence for that. Um, we'll start taking a couple from the Twitter feed. Um, uh, I don't know what the live stream situation is in here, but please speak loudly when you get your question. We have a um, microphone set up. It should be able to pick up your voice. Um, so, so far we only actually have one question from our Twitter feed, but uh, if you have anyone, uh, I think this was directed to uh, our first presenters. Um, Rachel McGee asks, uh, I'm wondering if contemporary media events are always being space. Are there distinctions when folks center on movies, sports, TV, for example? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, in, in the original um, Dying and Cats uh, media events uh, book, which I encourage everyone to, to take a look at, um, you know, they had a broad expanse of category of different types of media events. I don't know who to address, but it's a, a, a question from Twitter. Um, where do I look? Um, <laughs> that's a camera, I guess. Thank you, guys. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's a, they have sort of a, a broad, inclusive range. I think it would be fascinating to look at whether we have qualitatively different or new media events, um, given sort of the network age, and, and whether we can think about something like Trayvon Martin uh, as being sort of a new sort of networked media event, something that follows up, that centers public discourse uh, from a particular moment in time, and then, you know, our political science colleagues can sort of look at whether there are new paths of learning political information or engaging politically that, that take shape around these unplanned, unscripted events, perhaps, um, uh, more generally. So I, I would say, yeah, the typology is big, and there's lots of room to sort of re-theorize how we think about media events uh, today. I think there's probably also some space for the part of the question is something about supporting events. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those can be actually, I think, pretty rich political arenas, even though we probably think about politics. So I think about the blackout during the Super Bowl. And it's like the best moment in the Super Bowl is the blackout on Twitter. <laughs> um, not only because we got to use all the jokes we wanted, but there was, but there was lots of discussion about the politics of the, the prior moment where the Superdome went uh, black. And they said, well, this time it's rich people stuck in, so they'll get the power back on quickly. And those kind of moments, so that, that sometimes it's like not the political moments that turn to politics that might be more interesting or something like um, the Red Bull Stratus jump, right? So there's all this discussion about NASA being this defunded. But then just also as a media event, I thought like, the Red Bull Stratus jump was also something like the, the, we need to rethink that and cast to think about. Yeah, and I would, I mean, just to build off that too real briefly, you know, in their original formulation, the idea was that it was a pre-planned script. Yeah. Um, but the notion of what's planned and what's not is very complicated. I mean, as we saw with something like Trayvon Martin, which was, you know, a group of set of people sort of working in collaboration over a period of time, where it wasn't necessarily scripted, but it wasn't completely random either in terms of sort of what went viral and what folks did. So, a lot of space there. What was the idea of behavioral targeting and big data, perhaps like what seems completely spontaneous is actually scripted at a different level? Right. Um, all right, so from the audience, please. Um, so, Dave and I have been arguing about this on Twitter, you know, like for years, so it's exciting that we can talk about it now in person. Um, so, I want to take the comment you made, you know, that that social science is now sort of uh, subservient to the engineering of publics. And I guess I would say, good. Like, why is that bad? Um, and furthermore, you know, why is social science being used to engineer a public any worse normatively than torchlight parades being used to engineer publics, um, direct mail being used? To, you know, so what is worse or normatively um, more wrong about the current sort of state of affairs. Yeah, um, I'm not sure I want to make comparative analysis to say like it's globally worse. 
Um, but this, in this particular case, this is something that's worse, right? So that I can be concerned about the way uh, that public demonstrations of violence, like cross burning, engineer a social public and be concerned about that, in addition to being right. concerned about other. So this is not an exclusive argument, right? We've always been social engineering publics. The medium is always the social message. Right. It's just what that medium is is substantially shifted, and we haven't been paying attention to that shift. And so that's partly why I want to say let's, let's really pay crucial attention um, to that shift in that power dynamics. I do think that there is something substantially different about the way that big data now enables social science to be a sub-discipline of engineering in, in the way that DNA sequencing allows biology to be a subset, of, a sub-discipline of engineering. Mm -hmm. And that even if that's not true, our perception that that is true, our social perception that that's true, ends up changing the way that we form democracies and politics. I mean, publics have always been engineered. Right. Now there's a sort of a different mechanism for engineering them that is perhaps um, in a different set of power players. Right. right? In the past, Zuckerberg wasn't engineering publics, now he is. It's, it's possible we only think that because we're all sort of scared of engineers. <laughs> oh, I like engineers. They let them build bridges. I just don't want them to build my friendships. <laughs> uh, Zeno, please. Good thoughts. I want to join this conversation, too. And I want to sort of mix what uh, Dan's paper was saying, you know, Dan Moore's paper and uh, Dave's paper was doing to get back to what might be worse about it. I mean, I agree. I mean, it's a continuum in the sense that this kind of effort has been there. In fact, the paper shows it. Um, but here, let me, I mean, I think uh, there's a difference between better engineering and worse engineering because, well, not for bridges. I mean, for bridges, they would just collapse and you didn't want a bridge to be built. But I think with previous politics, we kind of know that like those ads that you saw all the time, they had very marginal effects. Direct mail had better effects. There were all sorts of ways in which um, they were pretty crude. They kind of maybe worked in a bludgeon kind of way, but I think there is something to benign neglect or more crude methods because they're easily easier to oppose. And also a key difference I think might be they're easier to be visible to. You just look at them and you say, this is as crude, stupid ad. So here's my scenario, and this is like, and I understand this is not a, a, a very realistic given the politics of 2012, but I don't think the scenario is completely unrealistic. So because of the better modeling and better databases on each um, voter, you have the ability to basically predict whether someone's an Obama or Romney voter to 90 plus percent. I mean, it's really precise now. It didn't used to be that precise. You had demographics, you worked at the precinct level, you did lots of things, but it, you didn't really know if this person is almost certainly persuadable and or already my person. Okay, so put that aside. Now there's a paper in Nature just a couple of months ago where Facebook did this mass experiment where they nudged some people, this is where the social behavior science stuff kind of get, comes in, uh, using their social network people, their friends, they nudged them to vote. Not to vote for Obama or not Romney, but they just said, go vote, do your civic duty. And some people, they nudged to vote using uh, a general message saying, go vote. Was presented in one of the talks. Right, right. So what happens there is um, imagine a scenario in which Facebook decides that they are going to 90% nudge the people they can guess to be Obama voters and 10% nudge the people they know to be Romney voters, not by asking them, just by modeling it. Now, what they, you wouldn't even know they did this. I mean, how would, because for a single person, you're either seeing, you know, your friend Dave voted, go vote, or you're seeing go vote, you're seeing a civic message. And this, this looks like a continuation of the kind of stuff that the campaigns, which they do get the vote at, get, get the vote at only in their precincts, but they pretend it's not partisan. It's kind of visible to everyone. Now you could do this. You could do this partisan voting nudging. That is almost cost nothing. Only requires the only requires Facebook be complicit in it, and you wouldn't even be able to detect this. Now, that to me is something that requires attention. I don't really have a quick answer. You see, it's a new form of power. I think that's a really well articulated point. Um, um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's a new well, I just wonder if you think we're... that's less dangerous, more dangerous? Than I, just... I think Mona gives us a way of thinking. Like, there's ways we could engineer this that would that would address some of these power concerns. And there's ways of, that we could engineer that would work, right? And so it's always a question of engineering, but it's a question of being transparent about that engineering. 
and understanding the power dynamics so we can be transparent about it. But right now, we're not. Yeah, I mean, okay. Uh, so please. Yeah. Well, I guess to follow that, uh, and to maybe push back against some of this pessimism. Uh, so if you were to take a look at the Obama case, I don't know how much it kind of fits your description as far as their applications and the strategic imperatives of what they're doing, right? So first off, there is some model to micro-target swing voters. Uh, this is a very small segment of the electorate compared to this huge swath of people that don't vote that, as was said, they actually have strategically made a lot of advances in actually mobilizing these voters using big data. So I, would, I wonder to what extent this is kind of just priming this very static voter dynamic versus actually using this as a tool to mobilize the voters. And the second point is, if you actually look at what the Obama people are doing now, it's not simply having people just vote, but right now in Chicago, there are people kind of frantically trying to figure out how to use big data to mobilize people for organizing for action, which is this kind of grassroots mobilizing continuation of the campaign infrastructure. So I guess my question is, Maybe are there also good aspects to this or positive aspects to this that are, if, they all, if all these other things evolve, you know, emotional kind of prime that people don't do in politics, but maybe this is good? Sure, they're good and bad aspects, right? It's good and bad. And it requires a lot of infrastructure to do well. You, know, you need a lot of expertise, a lot of computational power. I mean, it's, it's an expensive process. So, yeah. I mean, I would say you'd be more inclined by to have best interest to have it. Um, well, at the very least, they should tell us what they're doing, yeah. which, which they're not. Right? They, they won't tell us what they did. All right, it's officially lunchtime. We'll take one more question and then please. Um, so there, there's a part of me that, that wants to think, you know, um, you know, normatively, right, this engineering is not a problem. If we, you know, we can use our, our, our new technology to help democracy. But there's another part of me that's very sympathetic to, to David's argument here that says that we are breaking down social ties and making it really just one person, one vote, that's it. We don't need to come together. And I, I guess my, my question, um, and, and this is in a way connecting uh, a bunch of these really nice presentations, but it is that um, we can, we can, in this sort of an Alexandrian language or, or a Habermasian language, we can kind of use the, the you know, this is the, the system world infiltrating the life world or the, the uncivil forces of, um, of, of our, uh, you know, of, of capitalism and the state infiltrating our, uh, our ability to have real civic deliberation and, and, and uh, democratic deliberation. So we could say that. Um, but then we can also say, well, there's more active spectatorship, right? This is potentially positive, right? But then also maybe people are just posting some e-cards, right? So, so in, in what ways, I mean, look, it's clearly good and it's clearly bad. But I guess my, my question is going to be, uh, in what ways uh, does the performance of our politicians um, utilizing these new media, utilizing these things, and our performance of our journalists utilizing these new media, and the performance of our citizens utilizing these media, in what ways are they right, uh, lauded and praised right, versus just, right, we can just say everybody's using it, okay, that, is that good or bad? Right? Uh, in what ways are we going to actually evaluate right, our democratic deliberation? Through, through all of these, these, right? It's not simply new technology, right? There's, there's so much more uh, cultural things happening here. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Um, um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll speak very briefly to that. I, you know, I, the way that I see this all taking shape is that we sort of have layers on top of one another. So there's, you know, strategic campaign communications. Um, that gets layered on top of interpersonal conversations, that gets layered onto mass media, um, and sort of the social media production that takes shape around, uh, around, imagine, uh, around politics. Which is why I sort of, I think I take a little bit less of a um, hard view than, than Dave does uh, in terms of looking at the effects and consequences of this. I mean, I think I saw you pulled up uh, Etienne Hirsch's uh, work uh, at, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his first name right, at Yale, who's done wonderful work on sort of the limits of targeting um, and the, the limits of the capacity of this sort of market of targeting. Um, and uh, so the, there are limits. You're never going to convert an Obama supporter to a Romney supporter. Um, you know, at the best, I think you mobilize particular people, and there's a democratic benefit to that. At the same time, we still do have those intermediaries that, that play a very important role. 
Um, and I guess um, I'll end with, my, or I'll end my part with just a, a plug for, we're actually having a big conference on data and politics that's free and open to the public at Annenberg on May 31st. Uh, if you're interested in sort of talking about this now, Dave will be there and Zainab will be there and, and, and we're going to explore this over uh, a full day. But I'm sure you guys have other thoughts on this issue, this question. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>